All right, so today on today's video, uh, following along with the uh, gastroenterology NCCPA blueprint, we're going to be going over biliary disorders. So this is going to be cholelithiasis, cholecystitis, cholangitis, uh, cholelithiasis, as well as some tips in between. Um, so this is a pretty important topic for the pan. So let's get started. There's a few things that I want to go over before we actually break down each individual disease and, and uh, process. So let's go over a few things that I think are important just to know before we actually go into them. So I want to break down each disorder just to give you a general idea, and then we'll go into specifics about them. So to start off, um, cholelithiasis is simply a stone is in the gallbladder. There's no infection, normally no inflammation. These patients are normally asymptomatic, um, so there's not really any problems, just the stone in the gallbladder. Sometimes this is just an incidental finding. Um, cholecystitis is going to be when a stone usually lodged in the cystic duct, and this can lead to infection, inflammation. This is when you start having some problems with these patients. Um, cholecystitis again, is just going to be a stone, but this time it's going to be in the common bile duct. Um, may or may not present with pain, um, and most of the time, there's no infection seen in these patients. Cholangitis is one of the more severe forms of these biliary disorders. And this is going to be a, an obstruction in the, col the common bile duct. Usually, uh, it's due to stones. There are some cases where it may not be, which we'll go over a little bit later. As well as cholecystitis, it's not always related to uh, stones, but we'll go over that too. Um, and this leads to an infection normally a pretty severe infection with col cholangitis. So that's just a brief overview of all of those. Then there's a few things that you're going to see when we're going over biliary disorders that are going to just be repeated and repeated because um, the diagnosis treatment is all pretty similar for these. So let's go over a few of those. Before we do, though, I just wanted you to take a quick look at a diagram. Uh, just to break down, this is a really good diagram um, that was made by a student and just breaking down where the stones are commonly seen with each individual disorder. I'm going to use this a few times so we can go back and look at these. But you can see cholelithiasis. Again, the stones are just sitting in the gallbladder. Cholecystitis, they're normally going to be in the cystic duct here, which leads to more problems. Uh, cholecystitis is going to be in the common bile duct. And then cholangitis is normally going to be here more towards the ampulla of batter, blocking off the entire common bile duct. Those are the typical areas that you're going to find these stones, just to give you an idea. Um, and then let's go over a few things that you're going to see um, as we go along that's going to be repeated a few times because we're going to, it's, a lot of these are common in their diagnosis and treatment, etc. So most patients with biliary disorders, whether it's cholecystitis, cholangitis, um, in general, they're going to have um, right upper quadrant pain because that's where your gallbladder is, where the biliary tree starts. Um, so they're normally going to have right upper quadrant pain. They may or may not have jaundice. This all depends on where the stone is, where the obstruction is. We'll go over that later. But most patients, right upper quadrant pain and then plus or minus jaundice. As far as diagnosis, you're almost always going to start with an ultrasound. This is just a really good, cheap test that you can do bedside that works really well to uh, to rule out some biliary disorders, to take a look at where the stones are and things like that. So diagnosis is almost always going to start with an ultrasound. And then treatment in most cases, your ultimate goal will be to have a cholecystectomy. That's just a general idea of these. So let's go down and... Uh, go into more specific disorders and, and talk about those. So let's start with at the very top again. We're going to start at cholelithiasis. So this is when those stones were just sitting in the gallbladder. So cholelithiasis, literally it just means gallstones, uh, most commonly in the gallbladder. Normally no infection, no inflammation. The gallstones just kind of sitting there. Sometimes it can be an incidental finding. Sometimes they'll have a little bit of discomfort, but most of the time these patients are pretty asymptomatic. Um, again, let's take a look at the, the diagram so we can see again. So cholelithiasis, if you take a look here, the stones are generally just going to be sitting in the gallbladder most of the time, not really causing any problems unless they start moving into the cystic duct, but that's for a different topic. So cholelithiasis, stones just kind of hanging out in the gallbladder, not really causing much of a problem. Um, you should know the different types of gallstones. To start, know that Cholesterol is going to be your most common type of gallstone. That's about 80% of gallstones. So majority of the time, they're going to be cholesterol gallstones. There are a couple other types of stones. They're called pigment stones. There's brown stones, which are normally parasitic or bacterial infections. That's a... Uh, um, that's that's the color that you'll normally see with these pigmented stones. So brown stones are normally going to be parasitic or bacterial. And then there's black stones, which are normally caused from hemolysis, um, alcoholic cirrhosis. And this is this is known as a sterile bile cause because it's non infectious. So normally it's a sterile bile that leads to this. So hemolysis, cirrhosis and black stones, brown stones, parasitic bacterial infections. And then again, most common overall is going to be your cholesterol, about 80 percent of cases. Now. 
Let's talk a little bit about risk factors. There's um, a little mnemonic um, that you're going to hear a lot of people talk about. That's uh, the four F's, the four F's for cholelithiasis. And what the four F's stand for is fat, female, 40, and fertile. You may hear of it as the five F's, but that's actually incorrect because the fifth F used to stand for fair. It used to be thought that uh, this was more prevalent in fair skinned Caucasian individuals, but um, research and studies have shown that it's actually more common in Native Americans and Hispanics. So it really it's down to the four F's now to be more accurate. So fat, BMI over 30 predisposes um, to a higher risk for, for gallstones. Um, female, normally two to three times higher in women. Um, 40, because uh, premenopausal women around this age, the hormonal changes can lead to an increased risk of gallstones and then fertile. So either multiple pregnancies or pregnancy itself can lead to uh, increased estrogen as well as other hormones, which leads to an increased uh, risk of, uh, of gallstones, of cholelithiasis. Another one that you may hear of and you need to know to understand it correctly is uh, is weight loss so a lot of people think losing weight itself is what causes the gallstones but it's actually incorrect uh to be more specific it's not the weight loss itself but it's due to the the decreased fat intake the decreased food that these individuals are intaking which leads to this biliary stasis the gallbladder isn't contracting as much because remember every time you eat fat the gallbladder contracts, releases bile to break this down. But if these patients are decreasing their fat, um, they're not eating as much, you're going to have this biliary stasis, which leads to the stagnant bile. And when bile stays stagnant, not contracting, not moving around, it can actually become super saturated, which leads to gallstones. So it's not weight loss, but it's actually the decreased fat that leads to, uh, to gallstones. So those are some risk factors you may see in these patients. Now, how are they going to present? Well, like we talked about before, um, the most cases, most cases, I'm sorry, they're going to be asymptomatic. Most of the time, it's not going to cause any problems, but you may have something in these patients called biliary colic. So they may come in and say, you know, I was eating, so I was eating a meal. They may not say it was fatty, but that's normally what leads to this biliary colic. And uh, all of a sudden, they had this right upper quadrant pain. It only lasted for a couple hours, and then it got better. So biliary colic is this short-lived right upper quadrant pain, usually after a meal high in fat. So what, what happens is um, these individuals have these gallstones that are sitting in the gallbladder. They're not causing any problems. And then all of a sudden, they eat this fatty meal. So the gallbladder contracts to release bile. And then what it does, um, the stone can sometimes move into the neck of the gallbladder and block the cystic duct. Normally, this is temporary. Once they, uh, After a couple hours, the stone will most of the time go back into the gallbladder and the pain will uh, dissipate and they won't have any issues. So this is known as biliary colic, and that's what's described in this. And this can sometimes be seen in cholelithiasis, so it's something you should know. Um, as far as diagnosing, like I talked about before, you're almost always going to start with an ultrasound. It's cheap. It's easy. You can visualize the stones with this. Um, you can do a bedside and take a look and see what's going on. And then labs, you can get labs. They're not going to be very useful. Most of the time, they're going to be normal. Um, if you did happen to see maybe an increase in your LFTs, like your, your alkaline phosphatase, it may indicate that there's an obstructed cystic or bile duct. Uh, but most of the time, your labs are going to be normal. And then as far as treatment, well, if they're asymptomatic, you can just observe. There's not really too much to do. Um, but if they do start becoming symptomatic, they start having issues or they're a higher risk for complications. Um, some patients are at a higher risk of developing gallbladder carcinoma. And there's something known as porcelain gallbladder when the gallbladder actually becomes calcified. And these patients are at higher risk. So if it's a patient like this, um, you may want to do a cholecystectomy to remove the, the gallbladder. And just a quick overview of what a cholecystectomy is, because we're going to be going over this a lot. Again, this is going to be your treatment for almost all of these biliary disorders. So what this is, uh, you, you know, if you can do it laparoscopically, that's the majority of the time you will. Um, you're going to have these four cameras inserted into the abdomen here so they can visualize the gallbladder. And then what they do is they clamp down on each side of the cystic duct so the bile doesn't spill out all over. And they clamp it down and all they do is they cut right through the cystic duct, remove the gallbladder, take it out. They do a quick fluoroscopy scan to make sure that the biliary tract is still intact, um, going up to the common bile duct and everything like that. Um, but it's really just a simple procedure where they remove the gallbladder. That's all it is. Um, and most of the time it's done laparoscopically unless there's issues and they can't do it that way. But majority of the time, that's all this procedure is. So when we talk about cholecystectomy, you have an idea of what that is. Um, so let's move on to uh, acute cholecystitis. Now, acute cholecystitis is going to be when we actually have uh, gallstone obstruction. Normally, this is going to be from a gallstone. 
I'm not going to say 100% because there is something known as a calculus um, cholecystitis. We'll go over that shortly. But normally this is going to be when about 90% of the time when a gallstone obstructs uh, normally the cystic duct, which can lead to inflammation, infection of the gallbladder. So this, let's take a look again at the diagram. So if we look at here again at the cystic duct, in this case, this is going to be cholecystitis because now the stone is blocking the cystic duct. So the bile can't come out of the gallbladder and you lead to, it leads to the inflammation infection. So you can see the difference being co between cholelithiasis, the stone sitting here compared to cholecystitis where the stone is actually lodged in the cystic duct. So now you run into some more problems. So the most common organism that you're going to see in a cholecystitis um, is going to be E. coli. And as far as the presentation, again, like I talked about before, similar presentation for all of these, you're going to have uh, normally right upper quadrant abdominal pain. So these patients are going to have pain on their right upper quadrant side. And then they may have something called Boas sign, which is interesting because the right upper quadrant pain that they have is actually going to radiate to the right shoulder scapular area. So these patients may come in with upper back pain on the right side. So why does that happen? Well, it's because in the right upper quadrant, I'll show you a diagram here, you have uh, your phrenic nerve, and your phrenic nerve actually innervates the parietal peritoneum, right, overlaying the gallbladder. And this area actually um, travels all the way up to about C3, C4, C5, and you can see the branching of the phrenic nerve actually connects with the scapula of the shoulder there. So you have an irritation of the gallbladder, which can irritate the phrenic nerve, and then it actually uh, refers the pain up to the right shoulder and the right scapula. So that's why sometimes these patients can have something known as Boas sign, and that's important to know for, for your clinicals, for your exams, and definitely for your OSCEs as well. Patients may have this right upper shoulder pain as well as the right upper quadrant pain, so definitely know that. Um, and the pain is normally, in most cases, going to be precipitated by a fatty meal. So all of a sudden, they're going to have a fatty meal. The gallstone moves into the cystic duct, gets lodged there, doesn't come out, and then you lead to this infection, this inflammation. Um, on physical exam, the gallbladder may be enlarged, but the thing that you need to know for your OSCEs, for everything else, is something called a positive Murphy sign. So what a Murphy sign is, let's take, let's take a look at the diagram. So it's going to be right upper quadrant pain or a sudden cessation of uh, respiration when you palpate under the right costal margin there. So what you do on a physical exam is you place your fingers under the right costal margin, right under the ribs there. You, take, you tell these patients to take in a deep breath and blow it out. So they exhale pushing the diaphragm up so the gallbladder is further away from the fingers. And then as your fingers are dug underneath that right costal margin, you tell them to take in a deep breath. When they take in a deep breath, that gallbladder is going to push down into your fingers. And as soon as it touches your fingers, if these patients do have cholecystitis and acute cholecystitis, they're going to stop breathing. They're going to, you know, kind of jump up in place because of the pain that's going to cause when that gallbladder meets your fingers. So that's known as a positive Murphy sign. And this is something that's also seen when they do the ultrasound as well. And the ultrasound probe touches this area. They may have a positive sonographic Murphy sign, what that's known as. So that's definitely another thing that you need to know for your physical exam is a Murphy sign. Um, moving on to the diagnosis. Again, what do you think we're going to use as our initial test? It's going to be an ultrasound. Normally, it's going to be the first test ordered, like most of these things we're going to go over here. And the, um, the ultrasound may show a few different things. Um, it may show gallbladder wall thickening. Let's take a look at a diagram here. So you may see um, gallbladder wall thickening. Normally the measurement is over three millimeters for a positive acute cholecystitis. Um, the gallbladder may be distended, and then you may actually see some, some stones within the gallbladder. So it's a pretty good test. Again, you can see all this going on in an acute cholecystitis patient. And then if you do an ultrasound and it's uh, non-diagnostic, um, sometimes the patients are obese and you can't visualize the gallbladder well, or maybe just for some reason it didn't come back with positive findings. It was difficult to visualize the gallbladder. Whatever the reason is, there is another test you can do. This is going to be your gold standard, and it's a gold standard because it's your best but your most expensive test, and that's normally what a gold standard test is. So it's really expensive, but it works really well. So this is going to be a nuclear medicine test, and what they do is they inject radioactive um, tracer through an IV, and the radio tracer um, goes to the gallbladder, and then they give them something called Kinevac. And what Kinevac does is it stimulates the gallbladder to make it contract. And this, this radio tracer is within the gallbladder. And if the gallbladder is contracting and you cannot visualize the radio tracer, 
on the nuclear medicine study or there's decreased ejection fraction, nothing's coming out, um, this is going to be a positive finding for acute cholecystitis because there's something lodged in there that's not allowing all of this to move out of the gallbladder freely. So decreased ejection fraction from the gallbladder or um, not being able to visualize the, the radioactive um, uh, the radioactive tracker. So that's going to be your HIDA scan known as cholecystography. Um, so that's your gold standard test. As far as treatment, well, just like we talked about before, one of the things that you're almost always going to do in all these patients is going to be a cholecystectomy. But what you need to know in these patients is they're, they're a little bit more sick, so you might not throw them right over to the OR to do that. You want to stabilize them first. So they have an infection, they're in pain, so keep them NPO, give them IV fluids. Antibiotics are important here. Um, and what you're covering, you want to give them broad-spectrum antibiotics because you're covering a number of different gram-negative organisms, anaerobic um, organisms. So you're going to give them broad spectrum antibiotics like ampicillin, sulbactam, um, ceftriaxone, metronidazole, you know, getting your, your anaerobic coverage and your gram negative with the ceftriaxone and metronidazole covering your anaerobes. Um, so you're going to give them these, these broad spectrum antibiotics. Ertapenem is another one that can cover your gram negatives and your anaerobes. So broad spectrum antibiotics, get them feeling better, afebrile about 48 hours, give them fluids, NPO, and then at that point, as long as they're stable, then you can go ahead and go to a cholecystectomy. So most of the time, your cholecystectomy is going to be the end game, the thing you want to do to treat these patients, but a lot of times you need to stabilize them first. So another option, if you're unable to do a cholecystectomy, um, they're non-surgical candidates, or they have these potential complications, sometimes um, they're suspected gangrene, a perforation, what you can do in the meantime is something called a cholecystotomy. And what a cholecystotomy is, is essentially a stoma that's created um, into the gallbladder, and it's like a thin, hollow, flexible tube you place into the gallbladder and you drain the bile out. So all the infected bile and everything else that's trapped in there, you can use this procedure to remove all of that in the meantime until these patients are stable, you get rid of the infection, and then at some point later on, you can do um, an elective cholecystectomy. So that's how you would treat these patients. But ultimately, cholecystectomy is going to be your treatment. There's just a lot of things that sometimes come before in uh, you know sicker patients. So now let's talk about something that's not very high yield, but you do need to know just to have an idea because not all acute cholecystitis is caused from gallstones. About 90% is, but there's about 10% um, of patients that have something called acute acalculus um, cholecystitis. And all this is, is just cholecystitis um, from other causes besides gallstones. Now, it's only seen in around 10% of patients. It's not very common. Don't waste a lot of time on this. I'm just going to briefly you know, run through it. But it's really only seen in critically ill patients, hospitalized patients. So there's um, these are really sick patients, so they have this biliary stasis. It leads to stagnant bile. It's not being excreted. And, and anytime you have stagnant bile, this biliary stasis, it can cause infection, necrosis. And these are patients who aren't eating much. Um, they may be NPO. So these are going to be really sick patients that you're going to see this on. And this isn't going to be your average patient, wa patient walking in off the street that has this. This is going to only be your hospitalized, critically ill patients. And then as far as diagnosis, you can do an ultrasound to, uh, to visualize to see you know, the stagnant bile and things like that. Um, and then as far, you could also do a HIDA scan. And then treatment, a lot of times it's really just going to be supportive. You just want to make sure they're, they're feeling better, pain control, antibiotics, IV fluids, because there's not a stone to remove. So a lot of times these patients will get better on their own. You just need to treat them supportively in the meantime to get them feeling better. So let's move on to um, cholecolithiasis. So what cholecolithiasis is, is when there's a stone again, but now it's going to be in the common bile duct. So due to the location of the stones now, there's a little bit more of an issue. Um, they're now in the common bile duct. So now you're not only blocking potentially the, the gallbladder, but you're also blocking the liver. So you're going to see some different symptoms in these patients. As far as patient presentation, um, again, we're going back to right upper quadrant pain. Sometimes it can be epigastric. Um, and then there's a new symptom that you're going to see here that we didn't see previously. So jaundice. Because again, like I went over before, now the stone... Um, is blocking the flow of bile from the liver. It's in the common bile duct. So you may have this buildup of bilirubin, which um, goes into the blood, and these patients now develop jaundice. So remember that. That's important um, that once the stone's in the common bile duct, you're going to have some problems with the liver now and things change. And uh, one thing that you should also note here is these patients have 
painful jaundice. And normally that's a good thing because I don't know if you'll remember from pancreatic cancer, um, but painless jaundice is normally an indication of pancreatic cancer. Painful jaundice, though, is more biliary causes and things like this. Um, so remember that, too. When you have painless jaundice, a lot of times that can uh, be um, because of pancreatic cancer. So again, let's look at our diagram and see where this, this stone is at now. So like I talked about before, Coley, uh, docolithiasis. Now we can see the stone is in the common bile duct. So you see where the liver's um, draining into the hepatic ducts up here. So before we had stones in the cystic duct, were really just affecting the gallbladder. The, the liver was still able to put out the, the bile. Everything was able to flow into the common bile duct. But now you have a stone right here, which can back up the bile into the hepatic duct. So now you have some more issues and that's where your jaundice comes from and some of the other things that you'll see with this. So that's important to remember where the stone is will change the symptoms. So as far as diagnosing, surprise, ultrasound, you wanna visualize the location of the stone. Um, and now labs are a little bit more important because labs really didn't show too much before, but now you have this, uh, it's called this cholestatic pattern because of the, the decrease in the um the liver enzymes i'm sorry in the decrease of the um the flow of bile from the liver now you're going to have some problems with the liver so you may see an increase in ast and alt you may have an increased alkaline phosphatase and you may have something called um uh, increased ggt so um, alkaline phosphatase remember these aren't always very specific to livers for instance alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme that can be found um in, in from the bone the kidneys, um, as well as the liver, of course, um, but it can be caused from different things as well. So remember that too. But um, GGT is something a little bit more specific for the liver. Um, it's found in high concentrations in the liver. And when it's elevated, it can actually indicate a liver injury or trauma. So that's where your GGT comes in. And then of course your AST and your ALTs are important. Um, so some of these labs may be affected in a patient with cholelithiasis. Now moving on to uh, treatment. ERCP is going to be both diagnostic and therapeutic. So what an ERCP is, um, it's known as an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. And let's take a look at a picture here so I can go over what it is. So basically they have a camera that enters in um, into the duodenum and it enters through the sphincter of Odi. So they enter down here right at the bottom of the, the common bile duct where there's the pancreatic duct right here. And they visualize, um, they can visualize the common bile duct once they get the camera in here. And what they do is they inject contrast and they can see where the blockage is. And then what they can do with the stone is they can actually burr a hole through the stone and they can latch onto it once they burr the hole in. They, they, uh, they have a balloon that inflates over here. And once this is all the way through the, the hole, they can pull it out into the duodenum and then it just flushes out through the GI tract. So that's how an ERCP works. They have the scope that comes down here. They can visualize injecting contrast and then they can actually pull the stone out into the duodenum so it can be um, you know, flushed out through the body, through the GI tract. So that's how an ERCP works. So you can visualize the stone and you can actually treat. So it's both diagnostic and therapeutic. So that's an ERCP and that's gonna be used a lot in a, in a lot of these biliary conditions. Um, another option if an ERCP is contraindicated or it's unsuccessful is something called a laparoscopic cholidocolithotomy. And this is gonna be um, a little bit more invasive and obviously an ERCP would be preferred, but this is another option for patients if they can't have the ERCP performed or is unsuccessful. So moving on to something that's a little bit more severe, this is gonna be acute cholangitis. And this is gonna be when you have infection, inflammation of the biliary tree, uh, most commonly caused from biliary stasis from a stone that's lodged in the common bile duct, normally a little bit further down, closer to the, um, the sphincter of Odi, normally it's lodged in that area there. Um, so now you have the same obstructing stone like we did in cholidocolithiasis, uh, but um, it leads to this biliary stasis. And so none of the bile is able to escape and drain out into the duodenum. So the stagnant bile leads to this ascending infection. Um, and you get all of this bacteria in through the duodenum and you can have this, this really bad infection. It doesn't always have to be due to a stone. Um, sometimes it can actually be due to a malignant growth that's causing this blockage in the common bile duct. And then in rare cases, it may be iatrogenic from an ERCP, for instance. But most of the time, acute cholangitis is due to a stone that's lodged in the common bile duct. Again, let's look at our diagram. You can see cholangitis. You can see the stones are lodged right down here on the ampulla of Vater. 
and it's blocking all of the the digestive enzymes the bile everything coming from the pancreatic duct um, is blocking everything coming out here so you have this bile and this and pancreatic enzymes everything's just sitting in the um, in the duct and it's stagnant and it leads to this infection and normally again the, the infection is ascending from the duodenum it's trapped in this area here so that's what you're going to see in cholangitis as far as some etiologies so the most common bacteria is going to be of colonic origin um, so the bacteria ascends like we talked about before from the duodenum into the common bile duct e coli is going to be by far your most common klebsiella is a close second and then enterobacter species is going to be a third um, these are all gram negative species and again, all ascending from the duodenum. As far as the presentation of this patient, there's a couple things that you do need to know. It's going to be Charcot's triad and Raynal's pentad. You need to know these. Um, Charcot's triad is going to be fever, abdominal pain, and jaundice. Remember, we saw two of these in, um, in cholelithiasis, but we did not see a fever because there wasn't an infection present. So Charcot's triad is going to be abdominal pain, jaundice, and a fever. And in some more severe cases, you may have what's known as Raynaud's pentad. And you're going to add on a fourth and a fifth, which is going to be hypotension, and phi, which is going to be altered mental status. So those are really sick patients. In some patients, elderly patients or patients on glucocorticoids, the only presenting symptom they may have with cholangitis is going to be hypotension. So remember that um, if you have an elderly patient or a patient that's on corticosteroids, um, they may only have hypotension. And that's the only symptom they have with acute cholangitis, which is interesting to know and certainly important for your clinicals and when you're actually working. Um, as far as diagnosis, I'm going to give you one guess what our first line is here. So ultrasound initially, just like all the other biliary disorders. And then you're going to get some labs. So you may have leukocytosis. This is going to be neutrophil dominated um, as far as this, because you do have a pretty serious infection here. And then your labs, of course, just like before, you're going to have that cholestatic pattern with your liver enzymes. You may have increased alkaline phosphatase, increased GGT, increased bilirubin, and increased AST, ALT due to the, um, the biliary stasis there. Another option as well for imaging is an MRCP. So this is going to be um, when you actually use MRI to visualize the biliary tract. So this is more accurate than ultrasound, but it's expensive. It's time consuming. A lot of patients are claustrophobic and these are pretty sick patients. You may not want to wait. This is something that you want to get uh, diagnosed and treated pretty quickly. So it's an option that is more accurate, but it's certainly uh, more time consuming, more expensive. And then as far as treatment, so the goal with treatment, the eventual goal is to um, is to extract the stone and decomp decompress the common bile ducts. You want to remove all the sludge, the bile, everything out of there. But first, these patients are really sick, so you need to stabilize these patients. You can't just go in and extract the stone and, and go through all of that. You really need to get them feeling better first. So the first thing you need to do is you need to treat the infection. You need to give them IV antibiotics. So piperacillin, tazobactam, also known as zosin, is one option. Um, ceftriaxone, metronidazole is another one. Again, just like we used, patient, uh, used previously. Um, and you need to cover anaerobes, uh, coliform bacteria, and enteric streptococci. So you need these broad spectrum antibiotics to treat these patients. So once the patient's afebrile, they're stable for about 48 hours, they're doing better, you can go ahead and do an ERCP. And with the ERCP, again, like we went over before, you're going to remove the stone. You can decompress the common bile duct. Again, remove all that sludge, that bile, that infected bile. And then eventually the ultimate goal here is going to be to perform an elective cholecystectomy at some time in the future to prevent recurrence and to prevent future issues. So initially col uh, acute cholangitis, they're sick. Get them feeling better afebrile about 48 hours with your IV antibiotics, IV fluids. Once they're afebrile and stable for about 48 hours, do your ERCP, remove the stone, decompress the common bile duct, and then do an elective cholecystectomy at some time in the future. So that is biliary disorders. I hope that was helpful. Please let me know um, if you guys, you know, if these are videos are helping you. And good luck on your pants, your pantry, your EORs, and good luck in PA school.